Hopefully now you can see my screen and press play. And please let me know if there are any uh, issues. If you stop seeing my slides, if uh, you know Zoom uh, has any glitches and all that. So uh, before I begin, I would like to uh, really thank the organizers for inviting me uh, to give this uh, first talk of the series. And I have to say, they told me to, you know, maybe speak about something provocative, think of thing, you know, speak about something uh, new. And they didn't warn me that there's going to be such a large audience. So I gave them the title, which is uh, the title of some unpublished work, which is kind of crazy. And I realized uh, I am going to be speaking in front of 100 people. So as you can see, I'm very uh, intimidated, right? So uh, before I begin my talk, though, I would like to uh, thank my group uh, for actually doing this work. And we are a very collaborative group. Uh, this is actually the picture we took uh, before social distancing in November 2019, where we were at the workshop on topology in Delaware. Uh, the work that you will see today is primarily the work of Sean Fancer, whom you see here. And I love this picture because everyone else is wearing winter clothes. It was a cold day. And Sean is there with his sunglasses, his flip-flops, and his t-shirt. Not freezing, by the way. So we're a very collaborative group, and I would say uh, I felt uh, that I should show you the whole group, although this is what Son's work, because we talk a lot, we exchange ideas. Uh, these two guys could not make it at the meeting, so but I added them here with these stick figures. And this stick figure here is uh, because we are actually recruiting a uh, postdoc at the moment. And if you know of somebody that might be interested or you're interested uh, yourself, please let me, uh, please let me know. Um, now, what we do, right? So we are very much interested in uh, networks. And in particular, uh, we are very excited about circulation networks. I mean, we have in particular about circulation networks, which are necessary for any form of large scale life. Interested in understanding things like resilience, how this uh, particular how particular topology um, and other questions related to optimization so uh, so, so, El so Eleni sorry to jump in your audio cut out just a little bit there so maybe yes. you could maybe you could just review this slide briefly ah uh, yes so basically I was just saying uh, the very broad uh, scope of the projects we're interested in regarding networks it has to do with uh, uh, development, uh, we're interested in questions, how do networks build themselves? Uh, what is the form of an optimal network? Uh, what uh, resilient networks look like, etc., etc. But I also have to say, we are uh, in general uh, looking, well, it's not only about biology, we're looking at all transport networks and general principles of transport networks, and that could include water transport networks, uh, electrical grids, and so on and so forth. All right. And um, the basic equations in a way that we're solving is flows, the equations of flows on a graph, where you have conservation of flow at the nodes, uh, where the net current, um, if you sum up uh, all the currents, uh, the signed currents coming into a node, uh, that should equal to the net current coming in on out of a node. And then I have a constitutive equation that connects the pressure drop between uh, the nodes at the um, boundaries of its edge, at the boundary nodes of its edge, with the conductance, how easy it is to flow, flow through that. And if I take the linear form of this relationship, uh, then that's something that you're all very familiar with. That is Kirchhoff's rules, right? And you'll tell me this has been solved 160, 170 years ago. We know this. It's just Kirchhoff's rules, right? But yes, we take Kirchhoff 
and we change a few elements here and there. Perhaps we consider that the resistors are not linear and then we watch the systems do crazy things. For example, in this particular case, uh, Miguel uh, made a system where you plug in a constant uh, flow pump. So there is, this is like an EMF without uh, any time dependence, but then the uh, system has spontaneous fluctuations. It has an oscillating current. It's basically making, plugging in a uh, DC battery and getting an AC current, but without um, capacitors or inductors. And this happens because the vessels uh, are, have a nonlinear resistance, right? It's not uh, Kirchhoff's uh, uh, rule that the current is uh, proportional to the voltage drop, or in our case, the pressure drop is no longer true. And there are other things that we're looking at. For example, we're looking at not just flow, but uh, uh, what happens when the flow currents nutrients, and these nutrients need to be uniformly delivered uh, to the network. Um, and we are figuring out different ways where the network can self-organize based on local rules to reach a situation and a state where uh, the nutrients are uniformly delivered. Right. So these are just to give you some uh, a broad overview of some recent projects. But today I'm going to be talking to you about something else. I'm going to be uh, talking to you about uh, pulsatility. Right? And we, you know that in biology, it's uh, not really possible to build a large scale steady flow pump. You, we have pumps that are basically uh, that are os os oscillatory. And I want you to do an exercise for me now. Uh, I want you all to take your pulse, right? You're gonna tell me, okay, this is crazy. I know that I have a pulse. Sure, I also, I also know that you have a pulse, but I want you to take your uh, two fingers from, let's say, your left hand and put them, uh, not in the center of your wrist, but maybe on the side, uh, slightly below your thumb. And then you will easily sense your pulse there. And it's, it's quite strong. And in this talk, um, you're gonna start by thinking, okay, this is obvious that I should be feeling my pulse. And then hopefully, uh, after a few slides, you're, you are, you're gonna start having doubts whether you should be feeling your pulse after all and whether it's a good thing that you're feeling your pulse after all. And hopefully by the end of the talk, you will have changed your mind again and you will uh, agree with me that actually having a pulse is a good thing. So, um, let me step back a little bit and let's talk about optimization in uh, cir uh, circulation. Right? So it's, it's costly to push flow through a network. Why? Because, uh, you know, it's a fluid, it's viscous, pushing it requires energy. And the design, the network design will really affect how much energy you need, how much uh, energy per unit time, how much power you need to push a certain amount of uh, blood volume through the system. And Cecil Murray was a physiologist who was the first one who actually quantified this about 100 years ago. And he basically showed for the first time that the design of our circulation really, really, really cares about dissipation. It really cares to minimize dissipation. I won't tell you a lot of details here. Um, I will just tell you there are many more studies after Murray that confirm that our circulation is optimized to uh, minimize dissipation. But as we will see later, as I will try to convince you, dissipation is not the whole story. Uh, oops, I don't know what happened here. Yes, there we go. So uh, now here on this slide on the left, you see um, a heart, a beating heart. Okay, this is just to convince you that yes, the pump is pulsatile. However, for the same average cardiac output, which is basically blood flow, a time varying flow, which is the, I hope you can see my cursor, it's this oscillatory, uh, it's, the, it's the blue line, right? Is uh, more energetically costly than the red line, which is a steady flow uh, with uh, the same, um, with the same mean as the oscillatory one. And you can see that for the steady flow, you know for a single vessel, the dissipation is I squared uh, times R, 
whereas for the oscillatory flow, you get an extra term here in the dissipation, which, is, uh, uh, de which depends on the amplitude of the, of the pulse. So if you could somehow convert this pump here to uh, a steady pump, you would gain a lot uh, from, the, from dissipation. Now, um, the, another thing I want you to notice again in this movie is not only what the heart is doing, but also that the vessels that are close to the heart really expand when the heart is pushing flow out because the pressure is increasing. This effect has been very well known um, and it's called the Windkessel effect, that the vessels are elastic basically. And when the heart is pushing blood, the arteries, uh, when the uh, heart basically discharges its flow, the arteries uh, expand. And when uh, the heart is filling, the arteries will uh, um, relax to their original shape. And basically, um, you're. Elaine, yes. can, can I just ask a quick clarifying question from the chat? Yes. Um, how, um, in, do you know how flow is measured in these systems? Uh, you mean uh, experimentally? Exactly. Yes, so uh, one way they can do it is with Doppler. Actually, they can measure the flow velocity with, and in fact, this is how uh, it's measured in pregnant women, for example. Um, they, if they want to measure if the uh, placenta is working, they do like a Doppler ultrasound. It's, yeah, it's Doppler. It's um, as, as far as I know. It's uh, ultrasound. Um, so the uh, flow is, um, you, you can take this model and you can make a lumped model which is called the Windkessel model. And you know, it, you, ha you have resistors because the flow is viscous. You have capacitors because the vessels are elastic. You increase the pressure, the vessel stretch. And you have inertia because the fluid has inertia and you have inductors and you can put them all together and make this model. This is a lumped model. Here is the heart and this is the entire body, this resistance. Um, but now, of course, what, we, what uh, one can do, and by one, I mean Sean, is you can actually go back to the Navier-Stokes equations and you can uh, uh, basically make an effective model uh, that uh, consider that eventually lump, uh, lumps down to a mass conservation equation. And notice that V here is the pressure and you can think of this as a voltage because it's like an electrical circuit. It's a mass conservation equation and a force balance equation that eventually translates to this uh, graph for a, let's say for a single vessel and this looks like a transmission line so if we're, some of you are engineers and uh, you're familiar with this you're gonna know already know a lot of this type of modeling from transmission lines and I can take these transmission lines and I can put them to a network and I can solve this network and now I can if I give you the boundary conditions where I put the heart and what pressure the heart has, I can solve for the flows as a function of time, right? It's just, in a way, it's a computational problem. <clears throat> now, I will be rewriting things in terms of a resistance per unit length for a vessel, an inertia per unit length, and a compliance per unit length, RLC. And also, there are some parameters here that I will be repeating in the next slides if you forget them. I, if I non-dimensionalize my system, I can do it in terms of a characteristic length scale, which depends on the inertia of the fluid, of course, and the compliance of the vessels and the resistance, and a characteristic time scale tau, which is shown here. Now, with Son, we took this uh, model and we said, okay, uh, we have this model with elastic vessels and we put in the heart, let's do optimization and find what's the optimal design for this model. And we found something crazy, which uh, we thought the simulation was, there was something wrong with the simulation because the, uh, optimization uh, model went and put huge capacitors near the heart to kill all the dissipation, to kill, I'm sorry, to kill all the pulsatility to minimize the dissipation. And at first we thought it was wrong. And then we realized that it, the optimization was doing the right thing. It, has, it was us that didn't understand what the system was doing because it was doing something very unphysical that hasn't um, happened uh, in humans. And um, this um, type of uh, uh, transmission line, basically, if you this type of uh, uh, elastic vessel that is shown here, if you try to push a pulse through it, if it's elastic, the pulse will be attenuated in the end, right? It will be reduced in amplitude. 
Um, and um, in fact, this is something that happens in our own circulation here. This is a heart. This is the heart here is the pressure and the amplitude of the oscillations is a proxy for, uh, I mean, the, this is the mean of the pressure throughout our circulation, the aorta, large artery, and so on and so forth. And the amplitude here shows the uh, amplitude of the fluctuations. And you see, it's as you go, as you leave the aorta and you go down to the arterioles and the, and the capillaries, the amplitude is killed. Much like what our simulation did, but in a very, ex in our simulation did it in a very extreme way. So an elastic system will kill the pulsatility, but the, in, a, in our body, the pulsatility is not completely killed. The pulsatility, in fact, is even present at the capillaries. If you have a very sensitive measuring instrument, you could see, you could measure your pulsatility in the capillaries, not just uh, here in your wrists. So the question is, why doesn't the body just kill all the pulsatility next to the heart to minimize dissipation? That's, that's our question. Uh, so somehow, yeah, there we go. So the, uh, to understand this, we have to look a little bit more carefully at our pulse transmission. And uh, I said uh, that the, um, you know, vessels with uh, different properties, stiff vessels versus uh, soft vessels, are going to have different dissipation because the pulse that uh, is being transmitted through them will behave differently in a stiff vessel versus a compliant vessel. And here I'm doing the following experiment. This plot here shows what the heart is doing. So initially, you know, my, the heart is at rest and then right here at time zero, I start running. So the heart is beating twice as fast. And what you see on this plot on the left, uh, you see that the total dissipation as a function of time. Here at the dust line, I started running and the dissipation uh, increased in the system because the heart pushes more flow. Um, but you see that stiff vessels, they pay much more uh, in dissipation, right? They're much more, the, the heart needs much more energy to push the blood than compliant vessels that are, so, that are softer. And you can also see this in um, uh, differently, not this is just, here I'm just comparing three vessels, a stiff vessel and a very elastic vessel and an intermediate elasticity vessel. Here I show you many vessels. Here I show you the total dissipation uh, that the system has to, has to face, the uh, total energy that the heart needs to push the flow through the system for a network that looks like this as a function of compliance. And a low compliance means stiff vessel, and you see the curves are high up here. Note that it is a function of uh, a frequency of how the heart is beating. And look at the high compliant vessels, the vessels that do the wind castle quite easily. Uh, basically, they're like balloons, they expand and they contract, and they dissipate the pulse early on and they go into steady flow. They, it's very little dissipation. Um, so, as I click on my slides for some reason, sometimes it goes backwards. I don't know what this happens, guys. There we go. So, the, um, I can go and probe this a little bit, vet, a little bit more uh, carefully for a vessel that um, is 1D, not a network this time. I'm going back to 1D networks and I can actually analytically uh, and not numerically actually calculate um, basically what the dissipation is for as a function of frequency. And I can find this form, I won't say much because uh, I don't wanna go over time, but the, um, this equation here uh, connects the length of my vessel with this time scale, with this length scale lambda I told you earlier. And there is some cotangents and hyperbolic uh, sines and cosines and so on and so forth. But I want you to notice that for high frequency, when this omega is, uh, um, that when omega tau is large, eventually this uh, equation, and for long vessels, this equation 
will scale like um, linearly with uh, with L because of this prefactor, right? So it's uh, if this lambda um, for long vessels and for for high frequency, the dissipation will scale with this lambda I I showed earlier and I will show again soon. Um, so now I'm gonna go back and tell you about something else now. So we, we've established so far that uh, stiff vessels um, pay less in dissipation because they uh, kill uh, com compliant vessels are good for dissipation because they kill pulsatility. Now I'm gonna go back to my original experiment here where the heart is beating and then the heart is beating twice as fast. And now I'm plotting, this is in 1D, I'm plotting the midpoint current as a function of time. And what you see in the midpoint current is the stiff vessel. Yeah, the current very quickly goes up. So as soon as here at time zero, the heart started beating twice as fast. If I record the current, if I do Doppler and I record the current in the middle of the vessel, very quickly I establish uh, my mean, um, uh, my, the mean flow that I want. The heart beats faster so that it sends more blood and more oxygen. The compliant vessel takes its time. In fact, it takes a very long time. Um, and this is another way to see this in a different experiment. So here I have some initial, uh, at the, this is the, uh, what the pump is doing. I have some initial current and then at a particular time, I double that current. Uh, so the current goes from one to two. And these are actually data from, an, from a network. And you see the low compliance, the stiff vessels, immediately the midpoint current jumps up to the desired value. Whereas the um, compliant vessel take their time. And I will be measuring some, I will define something which I call the response time as the time it actually takes for the midpoint current to reach 50% of the value. So this is basically where each of these curves crosses this dust line. Okay, so I can, uh, the, I won't show you the, the it's a, very, a long calculation, but this response time is basically scaled like one over lambda squared for a single vessel, right? We, one can show that. Um, and if you take this to scalings, that F, the dissipation, um, scales like lambda, and this is lambda, and the response time scales like one over lambda squared, and you put this together, you get a beautiful uh, minus uh, 0.5 uh, scaling law. And these here are numerics, and this is the prediction. And compliant vessels are down here, and uh, stiff vessels are, are up here. Now, what this means is that there is a trade-off between dissipation and response time. And that trade-off obeys that scaling law. And that trade-off is that if you want to kill pulsatility and minimize uh, dissipation when you kill pulsatility by compliant vessels, be aware that you're killing the response time of the system, that your pump might start doing something very, very different and it will take a very long time for um, the network to fill it, especially if for vessels that are far away from the source. And what does it mean? Uh, how much longer? What's the trade-off? The trade-off is given by this scaling law. So minimizes dissipation increasing, increases response time. And I can go and I can do this in a network and there are some details here that I will, uh, I'm running out of time. So I will skip the details, but basically we can do the same thing for networks. And it is not, uh, we can also add randomness in networks and for reasons that we don't understand yet. Uh, the scaling law is very close, is very, very robust. Um, and it's very close to 0 0.5. And it's not obvious why this is the case, why this is such a robust scaling law. But the take home message uh, remains there is a uh, price to have a pulse. The price is that you 
uh, have to pay more dissipation to flow the system, to um, uh, maintain the flow through the system. But with that cost, with that dissipation cost, you buy something. And what you buy is uh, high response times. So I want to finish uh, my talk, my last one minute or two, discussing what else is a pulse good for. Now you're going to say, well, you just told us a, pl a pulse is uh, an inevitability of having a pulsatile pump, a heart. And it's also good because if you kill it completely with elastic vessels, you don't have a high response time. But actually, uh, there is a, another thing one should consider, right? Uh, most of you, uh, hopefully, will not have heard about this. And I say hopefully because uh, this is a medical intervention that um, uh, is life-saving, but you know, it's only for critical uh, care patients. Right? And it's called an LVAD, it's left ventricular assist device, uh, which has rev revolutionized um, uh, medicine um, in the past, uh, let's say, 10, 10, 20 years, where basically people that have a failing heart, end stage uh, heart, heart, fail heart failure, they get uh, this uh, LVAD implanted, which basically, it's, it's, they call it assist, but it actually takes over the heart function. And... Um, um, produces, uh, it pushes the blood through, your circul through the circulation. And that, for technical reasons, is now a steady flow pump. And these patients, uh, it's, uh, for engineering purposes, it, it, uh, it has better durability. But these patients that get these uh, pumps installed, they start getting, after a few years, they start getting some weird side effects. Their organs stop working properly. Uh, they get uh, uh, arteriovenous uh, malformations in the mesentery, which is something weird is happening in their body. And the control group where they get, they don't get these devices, they don't have the side effects, but they just die from heart failure much sooner, right? So uh, we're getting much, much more aware um, of the fact that our circulation reads the pulsatile uh, pulsatility our vessels read pulsatility and use it and they adapt to it. So um, these, the people that I have this device, they don't have a pulse. Yes, they survive. They move, uh, you know, you, you'll see them on the street. You won't know that they have this device installed other than the fact that they don't have a pulse, but uh, their body doesn't like it at all. Anyways, I hope that will make you think next time, uh, you know, you go for a run and you can feel your heart beating really, really hard. I hope that makes you think about how important it is to have a pulse. And with that, I'd like to thank uh, my group, um, Sean, who did uh, all of this work. Um, and you, of course, for uh, um, coming and uh, hearing me talk. And uh, I can take any questions. Okay, great. Um, we'll, we'll do just sort of a couple questions and then just to let people know there is after the end of both talks going to be sort of 15 minutes for informal discussion where a couple more questions could come in and too, but we don't want to go too much over time. Um, so one of the questions from Robin Selinger in the chat was, um, could, um, can you apply these models to traffic? And I think you, you talked about this, that general networks are something you study, but I think specifically here, you know, flexibility in traffic networks can occur by having a lane that can be switched in direction depending on um, depending on which side needs more flow. And that seems a little bit analogous to some compliance of the vessels. And is that something that you've thought about? Um, so change of di these, uh, reversing the direction of uh, uh, what a lane is doing is, um, we don't look at it in this context at all, but it's something that we look uh, in a different project that has to do with uh, diodes and valves. So the, we're not looking at it in that context, in the context of traffic, but we're looking at it in a different context. And the answer is yes, there is a lot of similarity of this with traffic, but to be honest, we are biophysicists, we don't care about traffic that much. Okay. Um, and maybe we'll do one more. Um, Andrei Zakharov in the chat asked um, if there's hysteresis in this response time. So you showed what happens when the pulse gets faster. Um, is it different if you go the other way? So um, the information, so that 
the short answer is no. So you, you will have hysteresis both ways. The details are different, but, uh, the, but the bottom, the short answer is yes. Uh, you will have hysteresis both ways. Okay, I see there are some more questions, but I think we're going to stop there for the formal uh, Q&A. Yes. Yeah, and if people want to um, 